Good afternoon. This side of the room, hi. That side of the room, good afternoon. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, good afternoon to, to, to everyone here uh, and online. My name is Dr. Joan Reed. I'm Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School. And so pleased to welcome you to today's Leadership Forum, Structural Racism, the Rules and Relations of Inequity. This forum hosted by uh, Harvard Medical School's Office for Diversity, Inclusion and Community Partnership, DICP, is sponsored by the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Minority Health Policy at Harvard University. Established in 1996, the fellowship is a unique program designed to prepare physicians, particularly physicians from groups underrepresented in medicine, to become leaders who improve the health of marginalized populations. Over 150 fellows and scholars have been trained academically and professionally in public health, health policy, and health management through coursework, activities, and events such as this leadership forum. Today, we're joined in person and online by colleagues from Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health, Harvard Affiliated Hospitals, local colleges and universities, and members and organizations and institutions from across multiple states. I want to welcome you, and I particularly want to thank Dr. Gilbert G for being with us today. In reviewing the disclosure forms for our speaker, there are no conflicts of interest. Okay. And for those joining us online, a few housekeeping notes. Live closed captioning is available, and you can turn that on from your own computers. The chat function will not be available and your microphone will be muted. Uh, however, we ask you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions for our guest speaker. And these questions will be answered during a Q&A session um, at the end of Dr. G's presentation. At the end, there will also be a set of poll questions. Please stay on to answer them. We actually do uh, use that information and it will take less than a minute to fill out. Now, I'm delighted to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Gilbert G. Dr. G is a professor and chair of the Department of Community Health Sciences in the Fielding School of Public Health at UCLA. He received a bachelor's in neuroscience from Oberlin College, a doctorate in health policy and management from Johns Hopkins University, and completed postdoctoral training in sociology at Indiana University. He has studied the social determinants of racial, ethnic, and immigrant health inequities for the past two decades. A particular emphasis of his work is on the role of racism at multiple levels across the life course. Professor G's research has been honored with numerous accolades, including a group merit award from the National Institutes of Health, Scientific and Technical Achievement Awards from the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, the Paul Cornley Award from Health Activist Dinner, and the Innovative Public Health Curriculum Award from the Delta Omega Honorary Society for Public Health. He's a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, NASM, Committee to Select Leading Health Indicators for Healthy People 2030. Professor G is currently on the executive committee for the Board of Scientific Counselors for the EPA and was past editor in chief of the Journal of Health and Social Behavior. We are so glad that you are here and thank you for joining us, Dr. G. Test. All right, clicker, thank you. Oops, let's go, let's go the other way. We'll have to load your... Oh, we need to load mine? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you should be able to hear. Awesome. All right, good morning, afternoon. I'm all discombobulated because I'm still <laughs> on West Coast time. So it's great to be here in person to check in with all of you and to share some thoughts about structural racism and why it's so critically important in this moment in time that we attend to this as a research and health uh, practice community. Oops. So I wanna take as my point of departure, Healthy People 2030, which as you know, is our nation's health planning document. And a key goal of Healthy People is to 
eliminate health inequities, right? And in order to do that, we have to attend to the historical and contemporary injustices that garner these inequities in the first place. And one of the main drivers of these inequities would be racism. And, oops, this thing is not my friend today. Okay, and as we think about racism, we, it's critically important that we think of it from multiple levels. We need to think of it at the individual level related to things like microaggressions and hate crimes, but also at a structural level. And these ideas are not new. They were talked about many year, years ago by Carmichael and Hamilton and many other scholars, right? So much of our focus has been on at the individual level, on hate crimes, microaggressions, and this is certainly important. One hate crime is one too many, but they are also just the tip of the iceberg. What sits beneath the surface is a much broader bolus of structural racism that really drives much of the, these inequalities. And it's not until we attend to the structural elements of race relations that we will probably make much greater inroads than we have already. This multi-level understanding of race relations dovetails very nicely with the multi-level understanding of the production of health. So many decades ago, Uri Bronfenbrenner created the ecological model where he basically said that the health of an individual person also was related to not only their personal genetics and access to care and all that, but also to their families, their networks, the neighborhoods, the culture, the laws of the land, and so forth. And so as we think about what are some of the drivers of these inequities, we might want to turn to thinking about what are some of the biggest interventions that we've done, the civil rights movement, right? So here's some data from research by Doug Almond. <clears throat> the X axis is calendar year and the Y axis is the post neonatal infant mortality rate. So as we go higher up on Y, more babies are dying. The red line represents the trends for white babies. And you can see that there's improvements, right? So the rates are declining over time. But now let's take a look at this green line. This is the trend line for black babies in Illinois. And you can see that there's a disparity at the very earliest time, uh, 1946, and it widens until about 1965, and then there's a sharp decline. If we take a look at this blue line, that's black babies in Mississippi. A much greater inequality, it rises precipitously, but then also there's a market decline. Right. And so on the one hand, you might say, hey, this is great news with the advent of a civil rights uh, intervention, desegregation of hospitals. We've made remarkable progress in reducing inequities in this way. Okay. Also, if we took a look at some work by, for example, George Kaplan and others, we also see that if we look at uh, increases in life expectancy, we also see that there are great increases in life expectancy if we compare the 10 years before the beginning of civil rights and 10 years after, okay? And these gains are greatest for uh, black women and black men. At the same time, when we take a longer time horizon, we can see that this optimism might be not as great as we would hope, okay? So if we start from 1900 to 2010, and these are life expectancy trends, with the red line being the 1965 period, we don't see this huge inflection point that we would hope to see and we don't see sort of long-term gains. We do see sort of a general trend in the closure of inequality in terms of everybody's life expectancy increasing, but it's not to the same extent we might expect to see if there was a massive intervention such as that of the civil rights movement. Similarly, if we zero in on a specific outcome such as heart disease rates, here from 1965 to about 1975, we can see that the gap is closed between black and white persons, but then it starts to widen again. And if we look at some work by Nancy Krieger, she essentially found the same thing. So what is going on here? Why don't we see these long-term gains? We can draw some wisdom from Derek Bell, who said, even these Herculean efforts we hail as, as successful will produce no more than temporary peaks of progress, short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance. So what is going on here? I would posit that the problem has been that most of our insights, once we get past the individual level, has been on institutions, but not on the structure, okay? And I will clarify what I mean by that. Okay, so here we can take a look at one institution, which is that of banking, right? So of course, 
you know, with the um, outlawing of desegregation of, home, of residential areas, you know, that opened up space for people of color to move into white spaces. Okay. The problem, of course, is that for many communities, homeowners didn't have the capital to buy homes. So you need to get a mortgage, right? So there's a lot of discrimination happening in the banking industry. And one thing that was actually pretty amazing was Congress mandated something called the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which basically says that it's a, it's a monitoring system for civil rights in banking. So if you go in to apply for a mortgage, the bank is required to ask about your gender, about your race and so forth in order so that we can monitor civil rights in a particular bank and across the entire industry. So this is actually a great data set. It's a very unique data set in some ways to understand institutional behavior, right? So looking at one specific industry, banking, that became my dissertation many, many, many moons ago where I did a multi-level analysis trying to understand discrimination from the banking, you know, from uh, redlining, as well as discrimination to interpersonal level, how that's related to health outcomes. Other people have done similar work. So for example, Mark Hatzenbiller has looked at state policies on immigration and so forth. And many other people are starting to look at specific places such as um, imprisonment and so forth, right? And so Michelle Alexander has a wonderful book on the new Jim Crow and all that. And we can start as health researchers to estimate how these associations might be related to health outcomes, how being in prison might be related to morbidity. The thing is this, the prison system does not operate in isolation. It's connected to policing, it's connected to courts. So we might say, hey, we should defund the police, we should change the court system, but again, everybody is working in combination. So if we only intervene and only locate our unit of analysis on one industry, we're kind of missing out on these connections between them. And they're also connected to the education system, employers, and so forth, and this can just get really big really fast. <clears throat> And so that's why scholars such as Barbara Reskin has suggested that we really need to think about racism as a system with a system-wide approach, using system science ideas and so forth. Okay. And I want to offer you, an, uh, you know, one definition by Zinzi Bailey, um, who said that structural racism refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster discrimination via mutually reinforcing systems reflected in history, culture, and interconnected institutions. I think that's a key point, interconnected institutions. And let me give you an analogy. So this is Buckminster Fullerene, buckyball. It's carbon 60 shaped, it's a carbon molecule shaped like a soccer ball. Okay, now take for a moment about, and imagine a soccer ball in front of you and you kick it. The ball will momentarily deflect but a second later, it would just revert back to a sphere, right? And the reason for that is because the forces that you exert on one part of the ball, it just gets spread out through the entire structure. That's why it's such a stable shape. Same thing for buckyballs, right? They're extremely stable molecules. And in fact, the chemist who discovered Buckminster Fullerene won a Nobel Prize for this, okay? Now, if you imagine that each of those black dots, the carbon atoms, are an institution, one is banking, one is housing, one is education, and so forth. When we exert a civil rights intervention on any one part of that structure, essentially the work of white supremacy just gets spread throughout the rest of the structure. And I think that's why we haven't made major inroads, is because most of our thinking and interventions has been institution specific without thinking about the connections across these institutions as a whole. And that's the difference between institutional racism on institutions and structural racism, which refers to this whole totality, this giant buckyball that we live in. Okay. So today, I wanna take that idea and expand it a little bit further about what are these linkages, right? So I wanna talk about these connections across institutions, and I wanna talk about one way it manifests in terms of this idea of racialized rules, okay? All right. So one way we can approach these interconnections is to use social network analysis. So here's an analysis where uh, one group was looking at uh, white supremacist uh, networks on the internet and not surprisingly, neo-Nazi groups are talking to skinheads. But the music industry is implicit in this, right? The publishing industry is also part of this and so others, right? Here's another example looking at right-wing networks in Italy. 
And again, it's the same thing. You can see the neo-Nazis are there communicating with skinheads as part of this network, but also political parties, music groups, and so forth. Right. And if you've ever been to a white power rally or just seen them on the internet, you know that music and all those kinds of things and experience and emotional experience is also part of this. Okay. And we can, of course, expand this to look at, for example, who's tweeting with each other. Here's an analysis looking at these groups across Twitter and so forth. So we can take some of the work that we've done on social relationships and kin networks and so forth, apply them to organizations, and then also look at it with a social justice lens. Okay. Now, I want, to I want to talk about this means that we can start to study not only the relations between groups, but the flow of money, the flow of information, the flow of the formal contracts, the MOUs, laws, and policies that connect these organizations together, as well as the informal practices. Right. The everyday things that we do that are hidden in our SAS code and all these other things that we do. Um, and they all part, they all form what I call these racialized rules. The ideas of rules is not new. So Eduardo Bonilla Silva, for example, has said that racism provides the rules for uh, perceiving and dealing with others. Uh, Chandra Ford and colleagues have said that our scientific disciplinary norms and conventions help to reinforce existing racial hierarchies. So we'll talk about this. Here's an example. This is a screenshot from the US Census, right? So these are population counts. How many people per group are here? I have a question for you, which is, how are these groups sorted? Are they listed alphabetically? No. Are they listed by population size? No. Are they listed by who was on this land first? No. They're sorted by this implied notion of a racial hierarchy with whites literally being on top. And it's not just the federal government. For example, here's a, here's a table that we all create ourselves, right? So this is just a random article I picked from the American Journal of Public Health. And again, the sorting is not by sample size. It's not by the dependent variable of the vaccine uptake rate. But again, it's sorted by this very predictable way of doing business Right? And if you don't kind of write your table out this way, it looks a little weird to us. This is an example of a racialized rule that goes across institutions, everyday practices that remind us of the racial hierarchy that we all live in. Okay. Here's another way it plays itself out. So I want you to pay attention to the concordance between the title and the data on these bar charts. So the title says African-Americans and Hispanics are most likely to be uninsured. And the bar chart shows that African-Americans and Hispanics are the most uninsured. The next chart says Hispanics and African-Americans are most likely to feel treated with disrespect. And again, you see the bar charts comporting. Now look at this one. Minorities are less confident that they will receive good quality of care in the future. The groups that are least confident are Asians and Hispanics. If we had parallel sentence structure, the title should have read, help me out, Asians and Hispanics, right? Okay, and now take a look at this one, satisfaction with quality of care. The two groups that stick out are Asians and Hispanics. So when our data don't comport with this expectation of Blacks necessarily being the worst off group, suddenly we get a little uncomfortable with our language. And we also get uncomfortable because the group that's supposed to be the model minority Asians might actually have maybe some of the worst indicators at certain points. So here we're doing a disservice to two communities at the same time, because we don't necessarily have to reinforce this stereotype that Blacks are always the worst off and Asians are always the best off. Right? But again, once we sort of get into this uncomfortable space where it deviates from our sort of implied notions of the racial hierarchy, we start to fiddle with it, maybe with you know, uh, titles and so forth. And here's a more recent example using data from COVID. This is the EPIC uh, data with 50 million uh, st uh, participants. And don't, don't fuss over the data because we know that COVID rates keep changing, right? But I do want you to pay attention to the point, in this case, the call out says Black, Hispanic, and Asians. Uh, patients had higher rates of infections, and the bar charts are like that. But in this case, when we look at risk of hospitalization and death, the light blue group are Asians. And, they, and according to these data, they have the highest risk of hospitalization and data. And again, the call out says people of color. Right. 
Okay, and it plays out in other ways as we do our analyses. So take a look at this research study <clears throat> where they were looking at environmental exposures, exposures of children in the Bay Area. So they asked parents, you know, what race do you consider your, your child to be and so forth. And in the Bay Area, there's lots of biracial children. So they had to decide what to do. How do we code and, you know, run esti estimates and so forth. And they decided to adopt a hierarchical approach to assign a single mutually exclusive racial category. So in this case, they evoked the one drop rule. So if the child was black and Korean, the child was coded as black in the data set. If the child was say Mexican and Korean, they would be then coded as Hispanic and then Asian and others. This had consequences if you kept reading the article because then later they said, compared to the general population in the Bay Area, our sample had greater representation of Hispanics and Blacks and fewer Asians. Well, <laughs> right, so it's built into our SAS code, right? How we code our data has consequences for our understanding of health effects for different groups. And we can actually introduce both sort of social bias and statistical bias into our research. So these are some of the some examples of these rules that we live by. And they, they move into racialized algorithms, which, as many of you probably know, is a huge topic right now, right? And so in many fields of medicine, oncology, endocrinology, and so forth, there's sort of a revisitation of what are all these sort of clinical algorithms that correct for race. Okay, and I'll give you an example from spirometry. And this is work by Lundy Braun, a wonderful book if you haven't seen it. <clears throat> where we're talking about a, a machine that you breathe into it and you get an estimate of you know, lung functioning, okay? The thing is, if you go to the user's manual of a spirometer like this one, you can find that there's an African ethnic correction. So you input the patient's age and so forth, and suddenly you input that they're black and then the value is corrected by 0.88. Most people probably won't ever pay attention to this, right? Because you're just busy doing your work, but it's embedded here. You have to ask yourself, why are we doing these corrections? The corrections have a blatantly racist history that we have to be understanding of. And let's go back in time to 1851, Samuel Cartwright, who wrote, it's not only in the skin that a difference of color exists between the Negro and the white man, but in the membranes, the muscles, the tendons, and all the fluids and secretions. The reason for this is founded on unalterable physiological laws. Right. So bio differences in health by race are biological in origin. That's what they're saying. This is, this is taken a step further to justify slavery because Cartwright also wrote, it's under the compulsive power of the white man, they, black slaves, are made to labor or exercise, which makes the lungs perform the duty of vitalizing the blood more perfectly. To understand this, you have to, you have to know that a fundamental assumption was that Black people were supposedly constitutionally weak and left to their own devices would ultimately degenerate and kill themselves off. So the argument here, twisted as it is, was that, hey, you know what? Slavery is a good thing because we're making all these black people exercise, right? Again, completely wrong, but that's definitely part of the thinking process here. And that's why we start to measure lung capacity. And we have to, oh, now that we're good scientists, now we have to maybe do some corrections in our work. That's part of the history of this body of practice in research. This starts to move into statistical thinking. So here's an article published in JAMA related to, to, to the Tuskegee syphilis study, where they start to talk about a lesson threshold value. So now we're talking about inflection points and graphs, right? And we can see this in the research we do today. This is a study that was published some years ago on uh, correction factors for creatinine in urinary uh, samples, right? So using data from NHANES, okay? So if you're a good analyst and you're saying, hey, I wanna do a study in using data from NHANES, which is you know, one of the best nationally representative data sets we have. And you're saying, hey, I wanna do a good job. I wanna do whatever it takes. You might then say, hey, we're gonna do this study of these metabolites, we'll correct for them because that's what we're supposed to do. These correction factors are created by people. And if you read this study, <clears throat> the authors had this to say. 
uh, racial correction factors introduced to account for the lot higher lean body mass and creatinine excretion rate of non-Hispanic black uh, participants, but no factor is needed, if needed, is available for other NHANES ethnicity groupings. For example, Mexican American and other Hispanic adults and children, ethnicity like race is self-reported and alone is not expected to have a major influence on mus musculature. If you read this carefully, it's completely convoluted, right? It's really hard to read. The logic actually doesn't make sense because, well, you know what? Like, if you report that you're black, that's self-reported. And if you report that you're Hispanic, that's self-reported. And we don't need to do it for Hispanics, but we kind of need to do it for blacks, right? It's really twisted. And I think part of the reason for the sort of, you know, tortured language is because the authors themselves realize they don't really know what's going on either. I think it's their intellectual discomfort that translates into this tortured writing to try, try to justify why in their tables, they start nonetheless to create these correction factors. So in this case, in this fancy authoritative looking table, the estimate of 0.18 is the correction factor for black participants. The thing is, if you go back into that research paper and you read the citations, they just pull this number from an, an estimate of an odds ratio that from a study that was not designed to study black white differences. They just kind of said, oh, here's one, we we'll just pop it in, okay? So these racialized algorithms are in many fields. They're in advertising. They're in clinical practice, judicial words, and so forth. And there's a great book by Sophia Noble, Algorithms of Oppression, where you can read about some of this stuff. Okay, and here's a screenshot I took about a month or so ago where I went into Google Images and I typed the word professor. The images that are here don't really represent most of the people in this room. At least from this exercise, a professor is more likely to be a child than many of us. And there's a great study by Obermeyer published in Science a couple years ago that was great that talked about algorithms in essentially the billing system of the hospital system that showed that there are disparities against black patients. And that actually once they kind of tweaked a couple of parameters, that disparity and sort of the triaging of patients disappeared. So I encourage you to take a peek at this paper. Okay, so let me start to connect these dots a little bit. And I still wanna go back in time to a paper by Frederick Hoffman, who was working for Prudential Life Insurance. He was a statistician working for Prudential. And this was published in um, 1896. It's an impressive volume that's 300 pages long of table after table. Here we have, um, you know, spatial data. Here we have mortality rates by race. Here we have uh, SES, essentially estimates by race. Remember, this was done at a time when they didn't have computers. They didn't have national data collection systems. You can't just go to the CDC and download some stuff. They had to calculate this manually. This is a life insurance company. 300 pages, quite impressive. But at the end of the day, it was used to justify discriminatory policies because Prudential issued a statement to their black policyholders that said this. <clears throat> the sum payment assured will be one third less than now granted for the same pre weekly premium. These changes are made in consequence of the excess mortality to the class above named black uh, policyholders. They don't, do not apply to other persons. So what this is saying is that if you are a black policyholder through, insured through Prudential, you know what, if you die, we're gonna pay you a third less than our white uh, policyholders because you guys tend to die more, right? And we're not gonna do any of this so, to, to our white uh, policyholders. So this is a racial correction factor. Right, not in the clinical sense, but actually operating through a life insurance policy uh, practice that has a, a detrimental effect for the black community. Okay, so the people who create these life tables and so forth, you know, are uh, many of them are forensic economists. Okay, <clears throat> and let me give you a scenario. Imagine 
a child dies through something like negligence or a car crash or something. So then the judge has to decide how much do we pay the parents for the loss of this child? Okay, so these judicial awards. And typically how they're estimated is, well, assume this child works until they're age 65, how much would they make? And you might say, hey, you know what? This child is expected to make a million dollars over their lifetime. So we'll pay the parents a million dollars. But, oh, what if it's a girl, not a boy? Well, we know that women make 75 cents to the, doctor, uh, to the dollar. So, you know what? If it's a girl who died, maybe we should pay the parents 750,000 instead of a million. Oh, it's a black girl. Well, black women make 65 cents or so to the dollar. We'll pay 650,000 instead of the 1 million, right? So these correction factors, these practices are also working in the judicial system in this kind of context, right? And so the people who create these estimates, the forensic economists, they, they actually did a survey of their membership some years ago. And they said, okay, here's a hypothetical. Imagine you're estimating the losses of a two-year-old African-American male um, uh, uh, defend, uh, not defendant, um, you know, uh, child. What data would you use to make your estimate of these losses? So about 48% of the people surveyed said that they would use gender-specific data, but not race. But half a percent said that they would use race only. But about 44% would say said that they use both race and gender in estimating these losses. Right? So some of the economists would do this, some of them would not. And <clears throat> only about 8% said so they wouldn't use either of the data. Okay. There was also a little qualitative part to the study as well, where they asked the respondents, the economists, to tell us a little bit more about this. And one person said, it's our role to be scientists and to bring to bear the best available data. To fail to use gender and race specific data is to make political correctness more important than science. But this view was not shared by everybody. Another economist wrote, I will use the data for white males as they are the only cohort that did not suffer any past gender or race bias in hiring, and consequently not continue the negative impact of race or, and gender bias. So the economists themselves are all also having a debate but they, while they're having these intellectual conversations, they're also these are real life consequences for the parents of these survivors. Right? So again, this is another racial correction factor operating with real consequences. And uh, there was a study by the Washington Post some years ago, and the story is what I've been telling you, right? So when they're estimating losses and compensation from these court cases, they're finding that um, there's a white male advantage regardless of education and so forth, okay? And so to kind of pull everything together, right? Many of us do the work of creating health statistics, right? And they're members of the government, they're members of the research community, the medical community and so forth. We create these vital statistics they end up being used by lots of places like the insurance industry. They're used by the courts and they can also contribute subsequently to wealth inequalities over generations, right? And so as you may know, the wealth gap between uh, in this case, Hispanic and black families is much greater than the income gap uh, with that of white families. Okay. So these, Racialized algorithms, these practices are evident in many fields. We are all part of this industry, myself included. Okay. And that takes us back to the buckyball, right? When we think only at the individual level, when we think about hate crimes, microaggressions, they are cer certainly important. I'm not taking anything away from that. But our units of analyses need to go higher up towards looking at institutions like banking, med medicine, housing, et cetera. But we also need to take a step even further to look at the interconnected institutions and how they work together to distribute the forces that ultimately perpetuate the racial gap. Okay. And a buckyball is even itself too simple, right? Here's another version of a buckyball. This is an endohedral fullerene, which is even more complicated. 
right? And I'll leave you with a fun fact. One of the variants of the buckyball is the second most expensive material on the planet. The only thing more expensive than that is black matter. Okay. So I welcome your questions and thoughts, and I want to thank you for your time and attention. Before we begin with the questions, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you for making concrete what many of us think um, and providing examples for those who question, um, is racism real? And for those who seek to think of it as only individual action and not understand the ways in which it is embedded across the system. And I thank you for that. Um, one of my questions, and as many of the individuals here are, are researchers or budding researchers or using the, these, these data, what do we do about this? You show us this, but then what do we do with it? Yeah, so there's lots that we can do immediately. And, and then, of course, there's all this long-term stuff. Right. So immediately, one of the things you can do is just go into your table ones and start to ask yourself, why am I ordering the data in this way? Maybe I should order it a different way. Some of the medical journals are actually moving in that direction. So that's one. A second thing is we just start to orient ourselves, start to start thinking about institutional behavior. So I'll give you an example. Um, so I was at a talk with a uh, and listening to somebody talking about purchasing practices at their university. And they were saying that, oh, you know, they found out that their university could not buy goods and services from minority and, uh, and, and women-owned businesses. The reason had nothing to do with prejudice. It wasn't like there was an accountant or somebody in the billing office saying, ah, we don't want to buy from women. Uh -huh. It was, there was just a, a policy at the school, and I don't know the details of that policy, that just made it impossible for the university to, to purchase those things. So they just kind of rewrote the policy and boom, that took out sort of an institution to institutional in, inequitable behavior, right? And so another thing I think we need to do is look at our own behaviors in terms of how we code data, but also ask the administrators in our schools who do these everyday practices like buy stuff and ask them, hey, are there any barriers and things going on? And what can we do to change some of those, those barriers, right? Um, other things we can do, for example, there is sort of this shift in how we think about what is discrimination. There's actually more than one way to think about it. You know, one way to think about it is, oh, there's racial bias and Somebody is going to go beat up somebody else and call them a bunch of racial slurs. But that's not most of what happens. Those are very important. But that's not most of what happens. Most of what happens is so subtle. We don't even see it because it's just part of the culture that we have grown up in. So if we actually start to, have, to, to broaden programs like the one you have, where you have more eyes and more voices for people who have lived the experience, then we have a new generation of scholars who will then start to talk about these things. You know, for me, I was really much shaped when I was in college um, in the 1990s, reading, um, you know, bell hooks and other people like that. And now I have bell hooks in my classroom, right? Who would have thought, right? So I think sort of developing, whoops. Developing people like you, was that magic? Um, <laughs> <laughs> de 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 yeah. Developing, you know, programs like this are so critically important for bringing new voices, ideas, and so forth. The scholarship is important because we bring, scholars bring ideas like intersectionality. They give a vocabulary to talk about the experiences that people have that they, they just can't articulate. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, what can we do in our clinical practice and so forth? These critical questions, why do we do this? Why? And then you might have to do your homework and go back to the history books, read the citations, the primary literature and so forth and say, oh, hey, wait, this is coming from a space that makes me really uncomfortable. We really need to take another look at it. And it could be that what we do today makes sense and is a good thing, but it could be that it makes no sense and is a bad thing. 
And so it's sort of, and that's part of the idea of sort of having a critical eye is to interrogate all these things. And finally, I think voting, creating policies, you know, all those things, the Supreme Court matters a lot because Supreme Court justices can sit on the bench for as long as they're alive. And this was not probably the intention of when the constitution was written, when life expectancy was probably what, in the forties maybe? And people are now living easily, not easily, but conceivably to age 100. So that's an extra 60 years on the bench. So all these things at all these levels matter. And finally, not to just only take a US centric approach to this, but understand that the kinds of inequalities that we have here are, trans, uh, are transported all across the globe. So, so. so one, one of the things that, a few things struck me as you're speaking, but, but one of them um, is this talk, this part about being critical. So most of us, you know, we study for journal club and how to read the article and how to be critical of all of that. But the examples you showed were just flawed. I mean, if, if, if you step back, you say, excuse me, this, there's a problem with this. So for me, it, it's also who's doing the reviews of the article such that they got published in the first place mm -hmm. that didn't ask these kinds of questions and the assumptions that are there. And then how do we seriously not just take what's given to us? Um, the other part for me is... Um, in this space about racism, and, and I've been working in this, this area for a while. Um, I'll just put it like that, a while. <laughs> um, I'm looking today at this tendency to, um, this dissension across groups about who, ha who has more discrimination, who has, and, and this fight across there. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I'm not a fan of the oppression Olympics, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, my group is more oppressed than your group. Th that does nothing. That is just one of those sort of smoke and mirror games that direct deflects our attention away from white supremacy. So I think if we really said that really the fundamental issue is who has power. And then we really focus on understanding who has power and why do they have power and how can we sort of redistribute that? I think that's, for me, uh, uh, an, an important I idea. And, um, so, and then your other part about uh, being critical. I, I had two really, actually, very good lessons um, my, from my days at Oberlin and then also from when I was in, in high school. So in high school, I had a, one of my history teachers who, gave, who came up and he gave in a lecture for a whole hour and we, you know, just kind of did this. It was like, I don't know, AP history or something. We're just like taking notes like most high school kids, right? And at the end, he said, everything I told you today was just made up. And that was an important lesson because we just thought he's our teacher. He's giving us the truth. It was just all bullshit for an hour, right? That was lesson number one. Lesson number two, when I was in Oberlin, I was taking a class in endocrinology and, um, our teacher, Jan Thornton, I just love Jan. She, she gave us an assignment. She said, pick an article that's published in a journal and read all the references. And I'm freaking out because I'm just an undergrad. I was like a junior. So to read one article would take me like three hours or whatever it was, right? Um, but that was a really important lesson because we picked an article in science and it was a, an article about rats and something. I don't even remember what, some peptide. And we read all the references. And what I learned from that was the references were mostly wrong. They didn't actually say what the authors were citing. And, and that lesson has really stuck with me. Like, wow, this is in science, right? That you would think is a top journal, but the citation practices were just in this particular article, were just a mess. And so that was also another way of really thinking that we really do need to be critical and not take for granted what people are asserting, even in authoritative spaces. So. Other questions from online? Oh, thanks. Oh, there's a lot. <laughs> I, I can have a story. Yeah. Thank you so much for this talk. It's great. I have a question for uh, about this around like the differential uh, race relations that goes into understanding structural racism. So 
So I work really closely on how anti-black shelter racism shapes neighborhood level inequality and establishes mentality. But then when thinking about segregation, that operates very differently depending on what like your children you're looking at and the mechanisms that are happening. So like from a methodological standpoint, how do you think about measures that, uh, how do you think about measures that could be across ethnomotion groups, especially as it pertains to structural racism, given that proximity to whiteness on certain scales may have differential advantages or disadvantages with other racial groups. But then also around like coalitions and things, so like you talked about like putting pressure on that wall, mm -hmm. if different ethno-racial groups are having sort of like differential causes, mm -hmm. how do you navigate like what's yeah, well, I think your point about coalition build, building is huge. And I don't think we actually have enough research in that area. I mean, I, I can't think of a lot of, uh, I mean, there, there's coalition building on specific topics like, you know, tobacco control and all that. But I don't see a lot in terms of coalition, coalition building, uh, you know, in terms of pressing back against white supremacy in a lot of the journal spaces. And I would encourage all of you to develop that body of research because I think it's so critically important that we that we do that and take seriously about how do we build coalitions? How do we keep them sustained? How do we think about fighting and power struggles that do happen? Because one, you know, like one of the things that happens that, you know, in some ways there's sort of this romanticization of communities, right? So, hey, you know, well, we, we should do more community-based work. And I'm all for that, by the way, don't, don't mistake uh, what I'm gonna say here. At the same time, communities also have, uh, groups also have their own agendas. They also have their own power struggles, their own power grabs. And if we locate all of the burden of sort of, you know, doing the, the work at the community level, we're sort of ignoring a much higher levels of analysis at the same time. So we should continue to do the stuff at the coalition level, at the community level and so forth, but also, you know, interrogate that kind of space as much as we would do anything else. But definitely we do need to do more stuff on coalitions, connecting that to neighborhood research that, that has traditionally more focused on sort of SES measures or segregation measures um, and all that, but really start to understand how do these institutions themselves work in neighborhoods and also the power dynamics between neighborhoods, right? So I live in LA. You know, if you live in a space like Beverly Hills, it's a very different dynamic and set of power relations to City Hall than if you lived in East LA, for example. And we don't actually have a lot of research that says, what are the, who has power in these neighborhoods? How do we operationalize power in neighborhoods within cities, within metro areas, within states and so forth? That's another big agenda for all the bright minds out here. Other questions, as you say that, it, it, uh, uh, other questions that are here. Um, one of my things for you is, as you show, <clears throat> I kind of forgot the right way to put it, we show metrics and things we measure over years, but the metrics that we follow have been developed by people in the system who've selected those metrics for whatever their purpose is. Mm -hmm. And is there a space or a need for us to look at what's going on in a different way. And maybe we're not measured, we're not using the right measures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'll give, well, I'll, I'll give a plug to one of my great friends and colleagues, Chandra Ford, where they're creating a, a surveillance system related to COVID and COVID inequalities, but like infused in that whole agenda, it's not just collecting rates of stuff, is sort of this awareness that surveillance oftentimes has detrimental effects for our communities. So how do you create science, good science, at the same time not allow that science to be weaponized against communities of color, right? And I think it really takes a lot of intention behind it to ensure, like, how do we approach this? What are some of the safeguards? How do we sort of have sort of feedback into our processes to make sure that we're kind of at least not making things worse. Um, I, I think those are important questions that a lot of times we don't build into our research. You know, so we think, oh, we're going to create a longitudinal study and we're going to, you know, measure these X, Y, and Z things, right? Um, but I think we need to start doing that. I, I think we also need to develop other measures of inequality, right? So many years ago, you know, David Williams, who of course is here, um, you know, developed the everyday discrimination scales to, you know, take a 
look at one dimension. You have Nancy Krieger, who's also here. You have lots of great people here, you know, who are developing those things. Uh, but then, you know, what else is missing from that space, right? That probably are in little tickles in all of your brains that maybe one of these days will become the next big thing. So that's what's exciting about being in spaces like this. Thank you. So can you use the microphone, please? Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Patricia. I just, first, I just want to say that I haven't been to many seminars where, um, you know, like the structural racism is discussed so in depth. Like this is the first time I've um, actually heard about the things like the spirometer be talked about. I've, I wrote a paper on it a couple years ago and I've attended multiple seminars since, and I haven't heard anyone bring it up. And um, it's a bit of a source of annoyance because I feel like the equipment that exists like that, that's so widely used in hospitals and other healthcare institutions really makes things just like the situation so much worse. And no matter, like you said, no matter what else we do, unless we change or remove equipment like this and policies like this, um, real change isn't going to happen. So I wanted to see like what your take would be on other than increasing awareness, because obviously that's the first step, how we would go about removing equipment like this and policies like this in hospitals that exacerbate these racial disparities? I, yeah, amazing question. Um, and thank you for the feedback that really helps me. Um, I think showing data that shows that our existing practices are not so good I think just saying that, oh, this stuff has a racist history is not gonna be enough to change. I think you're really gonna to need to do the work of actually showing the research, right? One of the cool things about Lundy Braun's book was she said that the samples that they used were not comparable, right? Because a lot of the, if I remember right, it's been a little while since I read the book, so I may have some of the details wrong, but um, I, I believe that one of the flaws of the, that body of work on spirometry was that the samples for black participants tended to be people who were kind of, you know, impoverished and they're comparing them to others. And then there are some samples of coal miners, coal miners. I mean, like, you know, so if we really take a look, a hard look at the history and the details of how this work was produced, and then we can say, you know, we have some contemporary data that shows there's a better way to do this. Right. And, um, you know, that the, the whole racial, the, uh, the, the specific clinical stuff is not my area of expertise. Probably a lot more of you have expertise in that. But one of the things you have to do is just create the data and show that there's a better way to do it. Because otherwise, I don't think you're going to make a lot of inroads. Next question. And the other part for, for you is um, Professor Braun will be doing a presentation here mm. in the spring. Oh, wow. About this. So. Send me a link. I want to see. <laughs> um, we do have one question that was submitted online and the person says, thank you for sharing your excellent presentation. As a physician and researcher, how can we provide our patients with equitable health care? Where can we start? Oh my gosh. Well, I'm not a physician. So I welcome all of your input. I can only speculate as a, as a, you know, as a patient myself. So I'll, I'll actually just throw that back to the experts in the room. But, but I, I think the fair part, not as a physician, but as a patient, what is it that you would expect or want from the people who are providing care? So I think, okay, so from that perspective, I think one of the basic things is language, language access. Um, so there are so many people for whom English is not their first language or medical jargon is not their first language, right? And so I think sort of having a, essentially more translation services, I think is certainly critical because there's so many communities for whom um, that's definitely a barrier, right? Even for people who grew up in the United States, that, that is definitely also a barrier. Um, I think another thing is just sort of having images that are welcoming, um, you know, that are representative of the communities that you serve. And I'm just kind of looking around this room a little bit. Um, but that's, those are signals to people in terms of, you know, what the values of the institution are in part, right? Um, I also think that we need monitoring systems 
that look for injustices that are in our in clinical practice. So the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act was designed specifically to essentially create a report card, right? And not just create a report card, actually provide data to researchers and communities to see if that Bank of America over there is discriminating against women borrowers. We need that in our hospital systems as well. We could create a humda for medicine, right? And that just takes maybe a lot of lobbying, <laughs> a lot of work. But those are some things you could maybe begin to do immediately in your system, as well as much more broadly at a legislative level. Thank you. Other questions? Here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Constantine, and uh, I'm the Bachelor of Bioethics program. I'm also a new EDAB fellow. But the question is, by looking in the people in the room, do you see anybody who is missing, any group that is missing? And I'm referring to very few white Americans, for instance, or white uh, folks in general. And, and how is that something that might be problematic from your opinion? And of course, whoever is here is great and we're all interested, but those who are not here and white Americans is just one, one group, individual disabilities might be another. What is problematic about the ratios and the distribution in this room? Thanks. Yeah, so you're basically saying, how do we not only preach to the choir, but to the people not coming, right? I, I think that's definitely an issue. I think, you know, you know, like my friend Cleo Caldwell and I, we talk, we, we talk about this in, in a different way, but in, we call it the minority tax, right? So it's like the same people are called upon to do all the DEI diversity kind of stuff, right? And so we all end up getting burnt out and, and so forth. And then who's not coming to these meetings? I, I think that's a really difficult task. And my best guess on this, and I welcome your thoughts, is to really put some power and resources to it. Right. I think it's not until people understand that this is so important that the provost is willing to allocate resources, give you course release or clinical, you know, um, brownie points or whatever it is, uh, that I think we won't really start to bring people besides the choir to events like this. So, but I, I'd love to hear other thoughts. I, I mean, I think um, parts of what I would say is about how do we move this from being the responsibility of a person or an office to being something that's owned by everybody in the institution and an expectation for everybody to contribute in this space. Oh, I love that. Can I borrow that? Feel free. <laughs> um, and then this other part for me is that leadership also being clear about the fact that when we talk about diversity and inclusion and different lenses, different asking different questions. We're talking about scholarship. We're talking about excellence. We're talking about improvement. It's not either or. It's about how this comes together so that we actually are better. And, and so for me, it's how you frame it, how you build it in as an expectation of everyone um, and not marginalizing groups within diversity because that tends to also happen. And each one of us in this room um, has our own set of identities that we came in with. And we make assumptions when we look at other people, but I can guarantee you our assumptions are probably wrong. And so how do we learn to value and accept people for who and what they bring and their potential to contribute and have leaders who say that this is our expectation for everyone? That's my take on it. I want to, because of the time, I just want to say, Thank you for um, a really remarkable presentation that um, laid bare some of the flaws that we have in our system, um, helped us to see what was in front of us, but we didn't bother to lift the cover. All right. So these articles and these flaws in these articles are not new. They were there when they were published. They were there when they were put into practice in terms of how we determined how we would treat or not treat who was included and who was excluded. And thank you for making it so present for us. Um, the part for me is how do we continue to push those boundaries and how do we act? There's a part of this learning that's wonderful, but how do we act? And you've, you've set a stage for that. So thank you for 
um, enlightening us. Thank you for enlightening us in this space that you mentioned. This is the, for those who are not here, this is the faculty room at the medical school. And slowly but surely in my more than 30 years, the images on the wall have been changing. Maybe not rapidly enough, but they are changing. And for me, this talk today is sort of a, a guide, a path for how we need to continue to change. Thank you for that. Thank you to Media Services for helping to make this happen. Thank you to the staff you know, in my office, Diversity Inclusion Community Partnership, um, for pulling this together. And again, from everyone, thank you, Dr. Jim. Thank you.